The scripture this morning comes to us from the book of Acts. Acts is in the New Testament. It follows the four Gospels. The Gospels describe the life of Jesus, his teachings, his death, and his resurrection. The book of Acts is the sequel to the Gospel of Luke. We believe that the same author who wrote Luke's Gospel is also the author of the book of Acts, and Luke was an eyewitness to many of the things that are described in the book of Acts, but he used testimony and interviews with those who were there for Jesus' life and for the early stages of the church. And so the beginning of the book of Acts describes Jesus ascending into heaven and the disciples waiting in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit would come upon them. And the Holy Spirit did come down on Pentecost. And Pentecost is a day that we will celebrate in our church year later on in the year after Easter. But this morning, the scripture is coming to us immediately after the events of Pentecost. On Pentecost Sunday, 3,000 people became part of the body of Christ, his church. And so as we read in Acts 2.42, this is talking about those 3,000 added to the disciples who had followed Jesus during his earthly ministry. In Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold their property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And then continuing in chapter 6, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? O Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us that we may be your body, healthy and active, and able to be all that you've created us to be. In your name, amen. So I'm going to invite you to pull this little piece of paper out. It's called the Eight Systems of the Church. It has kind of a little bit of a somewhat scary image of a human body. I don't mean for it to be macabre, but uh, that's there. I want you to take it and I want you to open it up. And then I want you all together, let's just go ahead and rip it apart. So now there's two.
Good, now we got all of that uh, paper rustling out of the way. This part that has the picture of the body and then the writing on the back, this is yours to keep. This part that has the Mount Moriah logo and has eight blanks on it, this is yours to turn in to me at the end of the worship service. Keep this, give me this. Does that make sense? Good. Now, don't give this to me blank. That does none of us any good. Instead, what I need you to do is I need you to fill this form out during the course of the message because I'm going to explain the things that are on this sheet and I'm praying that the Holy Spirit will be upon you and guide you to pick two of these systems. It says three, but I'm willing to settle for two that you are willing to to hear more about. I'm not asking you to make any specific time commitment. I'm not asking you to join any kind of a committee. This is a low-key commitment, but it's an important one because I want you to step out in faith and say, yes, I want to be part of Mount Moriah's healthy body of Christ by picking two of these that I'm going to talk about and explain this morning. We're talking about systems. Systems are things that help us to do all that we need to do. And this book of Acts and the chapters that I read to you help us to see systems in action. Now think about your body for a moment. You have a heart. Your heart pumps blood. That blood gets sent to your brain. It gets sent to your limbs, sent to your feet. That blood goes everywhere, and it's very important. What happens if your heart stops beating and the blood stops flowing in your circulatory system? You die. It's that simple. You're done. Everybody take a deep breath. And let it out. You just gave yourself a whole bunch of oxygen that your lungs then are taking and putting it in that blood so you have a respiratory system that helps to rejuvenate and give you energy. What happens if you quit breathing? You die. You're done. You have a skeletal system. You have bones that hold your body together. What happens if you don't have any bones? You're a puddle on the floor. And you can't move because your muscles need your skeleton to be able to do things. If there's nothing to pull against, you're not moving. That's a pretty boring life to be a puddle on the floor. So our bodies have all these different systems. And if these systems aren't healthy, bad things happen, including death. Right? Are you with me so far? The church also has systems. Whether we recognize them or not, the church lives with systems. And if our systems are healthy, the church is healthy and we are growing, we are vibrant, and we are able to be everything that God wants us to be. But if our systems are sick or if our systems are dying, then the church is in danger of dying. So systems are vital. They are important and they need to be healthy, whether it's our bodies or our church as the body of Christ. Now the story in Acts, we see systems being put in place because the apostles are engaged in doing things to help those people grow in their faith, in their knowledge, in their love for God and for one another. Now, as you look at this, you'll see that a system is anything that saves you stress, time, energy, or money. How many of you like to have reductions in stress? Anybody live for stress? I didn't think so. So if a system helps save us stress, that's a good thing. 
Who likes to spend time wisely? Now, some of us still sit in front of the couch and watch TV for too long or pull out our phones and play with those screens for too long, but systems that help us use time effectively help us to have the time to be able to do those leisure activities. We need to use our time well. Energy. Who wants more energy? Everybody except two-year-olds. They have enough all on their own. They don't need more, but the parents certainly do. I know because I have granddaughters that are in that age range. Money. Who likes to waste money? No. Do we want to spend money wisely? Yes. So our systems allow us to save on stress, on time, on energy, on money. That's a good thing. So what are the systems of the church? Well, we have a worship system. That's what we're doing here this morning. And if we don't have a system that allows us to plan worship and to implement worship and to engage in worship, then we're missing out on that connection to God and to each other. And so we need a worship system that's healthy, that allows us to engage and leave on a Sunday morning excited and ready to deal with the rest of our lives in the rest of the week. We need an evangelism system. Now, evangelism is a word that's kind of gotten a bad rap over the last few decades, and people are afraid of it. We tend to think of things like knocking door to door and saying a question like, if you were to die tonight, are you going to heaven or hell? That's not a very fun question to ask or consider, and it's really not an effective way to talk about the good news of Jesus Christ. But evangelism done well is all about relationship. Last Sunday, I talked about inviting. Well, evangelism is the inviting system that we need to put in place that makes us intentional about trying to attract and engage new people coming into the life of our church. When people come, we want them to not come just once and then never come back again, right? So that means we need an assimilation system that helps them to become fully engaged and part of our family of faith. And so we turn them from first-time guests into fully engaged members. We need a small group system that's healthy. Small groups are the way that we really get to know one another and deepen our faith in God. You can come to worship for an hour, and if that's all you do, that's okay, but I'm going to tell you it's not healthy. Being healthy in your faith in Christ means being in a small group. And I've got an audacious goal. 100% participation by every adult in our congregation in a small group. Because that's the glue that holds us together. We can have 100 in worship, 200 in worship, 500 in worship. Can you engage with one another one-to-one with those kinds of numbers? No. And so small groups help us to truly know one another and to know each other deeply and intimately and support each other. So we need a healthy small group system. We need a ministry system that lets us connect people with need and help us to feel like we are truly making a difference in the world. Now, I'm a little bit lucky because I get to preach to you every Sunday. That's my connection to ministry. And what I hope to see over the course of time is my preaching bearing fruit by changed lives. But you need ways to connect into ministry and the ministry system is how we make those connections happen so that you are able to use your gifts your talents your skills your enthusiasm in the right place so that when you do it you know you've made a difference we need a stewardship system 
Stewardship is talking about money. I'll be blunt. We need money to do the things in the church. Money is the circulatory system of the body of Christ. Money is how we're able to do everything else. And so a stewardship system helps us grow from being non-giving people to being generous givers. The scriptures promise us that we can't outgive God. Do you believe that? Well, a healthy stewardship system is going to prove it over and over and over again because as we give, God gives back more. And we need a leadership system, a leadership system that will help us to engage and do the right things in the right way at the right time. It's probably not politically correct to say this anymore, but have you ever heard the phrase, too many chiefs and not enough Indians? That's when a person says, I'm in charge. And the next person says, no, I'm in charge. And the next person says, well, I'm in charge. And the next person says, I'm in charge. And if you've got five people all trying to say, I'm in charge, here's how we do it, what happens? Nothing. Nothing gets done because we're bickering over who's the boss instead of engaging in the worship and the work and the ministry of the church. And so the leadership system helps us to get out of that trap and it makes leaders equipped to do well in leading. And finally, we need strategy systems. We need to know how to evaluate what we're doing and to figure out what we're doing well and figure out what we're not doing so well. How can we improve? Now, anybody think that we can improve as Mount Moriah United Methodist Church? Anybody know how to make us improve? That's why our system needs to be healthy so that we can begin to answer that question. Now, in the early church, they created systems from the very beginning. That's what it says, that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They had systems in place that were helping them to do those things and to do it well. They had a system in place that allowed people to be generous and take care of needs so that there wasn't anybody who was lacking in a basic necessity. They met together in homes. That's why I want to have dinner with you in your homes as part of a healthy system. With glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of the people. That sounds pretty healthy to me. But things got a little bit difficult because all of a sudden you've got the Hebraic Jews and the Hellenistic Jews bickering with each other. Now, does anybody know what a Hebraic or a Hellenistic Jew is? Well, let me give you a little bit of background. The Hebraic Jews were the Jews that spoke Aramaic as their primary language. The Hellenistic Jews were the people who spoke Greek as their primary language. Now what happens when you have two groups of people who don't really speak each other's language? You can run into problems communicating well. And evidently that's what's going on here because you've got one group of people mad at the other group of people. So if we take this center aisle, all of you are the Hellenistic Jews, all of you are the Hebraic Jews, and you're mad at them and you're mad at them. And what does it look like? Ugly, right? You're over here complaining and you're over here fussing about the complaints. And so the apostles said, look, guys, we need a new system. We need to figure out how to do everything well and do everything right. So let's pray and you pick, two, you pick seven people with two characteristics, full of wisdom, full of God's spirit. Problem solved. Now, wouldn't it be amazing if we had people full of wisdom, full of the Holy Spirit, working on our issues, making our church healthy? Well, I believe that there are people in this room that meet those requirements. And the way you're going to help me know that is you're going to fill out those forms. 
And in a few moments, we're going to sing our closing hymn, and I'm going to invite you, as you're able, I'm going to have this basket, go ahead and show it to you, and you can put your response in the basket. And then I will collect and collate this information, and I will be in contact with you to talk about those systems that you've expressed interest in. Friends, it's a little ask with the opportunity for an amazing blessing. And so I'm going to pray, and we're going to sing, and I'm going to ask you to respond. God, we pray that you would help us to be like that early church in Acts, where we are adding numbers, not just to be bigger, but because we are impacting lives. God, may we have healthy systems in our congregation so that we can save stress, time, energy, and money and be employed in doing your good work because we are good people led by a good God. Give them discernment to pick to. Give them the willingness to commit and to say, yes, I'm willing to be a part of the solutions that will bring this church into the place you've called it to be. We thank you for your love and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. I look forward to reading these and moving forward together. So as you go forth from this place, may your brain, your belly, and your bottom be good to you so that you may be the hands and the feet and the voice of Christ going out into this world to be healthy, to engage, and to make a difference. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.